Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you ever so much for inviting me to uh, come and talk with you this evening. Um, I would prefer it if, if we have an interactive session, so if you feel there are things that you would like to ask or interrogate, then please ask me, and I'll probably say, yeah, that's coming up in a bit, but please feel free to do so. So, I, I can't imagine that when Richard made contact with me, I think it was back in February, I couldn't have imagined that we'd be actually here together. And so it's really quite an achievement to find that finally we are back in a room with other people. And it's one of the things I've noticed as a doctor is that people have almost forgotten how to be with other people. And we've seen quite a lot of aggression, quite a lot of nastiness. So to come into a, a room which is as warm and welcoming as this is incredibly uh, satisfying. So thank you for your welcome. A little bit of a plan. Oh, this is me. <laughs> um, I, I really don't like doing the social media stuff. Um, but I have got a, a Twitter personality and this is it. Um, I've had that for several years. Uh, I just quite like the photograph because it seems to represent that sort of, I don't know, slightly madcap person that I'd like to think I am, deep down. I wish I was as skinny as that, but unfortunately <laughs> I'm not. So, so who am I? Okay, so as, I, as you said, I'm, I'm the medical director of LIVES. So LIVES is a, is a Lincolnshire charity, which I hope that you've heard of, but you may well not have done. It's been going for 51 years now, and I'm going to go through some of those 51 years and what's happened in that time and why perhaps it is relevant to people such as yourselves. So it was started way back in 1970, and I'll go a little bit into that history, but it's actually about trying to bring an enhanced level of care to people who have their worst ever day, whether that be on the roads, whether that be a medical incident, whether it be shortness of breath, or some trauma that they've sustained at home. And at the time that lives began, there was a real need for that enhanced level of care. And although the world has moved on, the enhancements that we can bring have also moved on, and I'd like to go through some of those with you. I'd like to, well, so I suppose, well, what's a medical director? Well, we're registered um, with the Care Quality Commission as a provider of health services, and as a result, we have an obligation to meet the conditions set down in the, the Health and Care Act. And my responsibility is to make sure that what we deliver is safe and effective, that it's caring, that it's well-led, and it's responsive to the need. Because the needs that exist within our county are not the same needs that exist, say, within inner city London. So that's my responsibility, is to try and deliver that obligation under the Care Quality Commission. I'd like to take you through a 30-year perspective, which is what I've been doing pre-hospital emergency care for. It's actually 33, but 30 is near enough. Because a lot has changed over that time. Yeah, I've put weight on, I've got older, and I find that actually my mind still thinks I can do things that my body knows I can't. And this last week I've been knocking down a brick out building. And it's strange, isn't it? As you get older, your life is accompanied by a series of noises as you move around, particularly when you've done things like knocking down brick buildings. So, oh, oh. so my wife knows where I am and the dog knows where I am. So let's go back to 1967. So why? why that's not 30 years. That is 30. No, it's a lot more. 53 years, 52 years. No, it's even more. That's 55 years. Maths was never my strong point, so God help you if I've got to give you a dosage of a drug. Um, why is this relevant? Well, 1967, I was three, and the Morris Traveller van is what my parents had, and I was taken about, around, well, not at three, probably a little bit younger than that, in a carry cot that was just stuck on the back seat of the car. That was fairly standard in 1967. But in 1967, the number of people who were dying or seriously injured on the roads was massive. 
was probably the highest since it had been in wartime in 1945, which was the all-time highest instance. And this started to trouble some people. And in particular, a chap called Ken Easton in, in Catterick in North Yorkshire, who was a, um, a GP who'd left the army and became very aware of how many people were dying on the A1 in North Yorkshire near Catterick. And he teamed up with a local company that was doing rescue, sort of basically a haulage company picking up broken cars off the road type of thing. And between them, they came up with the concept of immediate care, where doctors would go out to these accidents, delivering enhanced care and improving the outcomes, both in terms of the illness that people uh, suffered, but also the death rate. And as a result of that, other people around the country started to notice this. And here in Lincolnshire, this gentleman, Dr. Cooper from Nettleham, along with Dr. Richard Harper-Smith from Tetford, convened a meeting of doctors, and over 100 doctors in, in, uh, attended um, and showed interest in a similar scheme being produced here in Lincolnshire. And as a result, Lives was born. And it became one of the British Association for Immediate Care Schemes, BASICS. Which is a, it's, it's a difficult acronym, really, because I go and describe myself, or used to, as I'm a basic doctor. Well, actually, I'd like a good one, if that's okay. So it's just really a bit unfortunate. So there we are, Dr. Cooper, with a range of the kit, including a J-Reg car, giving it the date. 1973, this is the sort of ambulance that we were talking about in 1973. 1974, Dr. Cooper became ill and resigned and Dr. Harpersmith took over as the chairman um, and he stayed the chairman for many years and only recently died in the last two to three years. So under their guidance and leadership, they started introducing things like transmitters at Fullerton, for example, and Barton upon Humber, and eventually they ended up with a range of radio transmitters which were run from a room at Lincoln County Hospital by which all the doctors were activated. 1987, moving on a little bit further. At this point, they'd got um, a total of seven transmitters throughout the county. And at that time, it was costing about £10,000 a year in 1987 to run those transmitters, a significant amount of money. And so it was realised that something had to change um, to, to ensure that this could be maintained as a service. And in 1990, the um, control moved to Bracebridge Heath to the newly opened radio, uh, sorry, ambulance control that's there now. And there we have Mike Ruffle standing on the right and Dr. Harper Smith on the left. So a real blast from the past. But in 1990, this is the sort of kit that we would be getting. There's a Ford Orion 1.6, which was being provided by uh, um, Edmondson's in Spalding. To the, the doctor there, crouching down, Dr. Kieran Wiscombe, they sponsored him to actually drive one of their vehicles to respond, carrying with him the, equip the equipment. But in 1990, I don't expect you can see this, this document became published within Lincolnshire, which was referred to as the purpose of ambulance work, and was actually to look at the changing role of the hitherto ambulance driver. Up to that point, the primary role of the ambulance service was transportation of the sick and injured, with a secondary role to deliver ambulance aid. And that was why 
During that time, the doctors who were volunteering were bringing additional information, additional skills above and beyond that that the ambulance men and women could provide. But this was the beginning of a real sea change in how medical care happened pre-hospitally. Because there was a beginning of an emphasis on to actually the development of medical skills. And I've got this lovely photograph there that I found in an old document that I found of Horncastle's first paramedic, 1990 bringing at that point the number of paramedics in the whole of Lincolnshire to 21. He was the 21st to become qualified. And that was a real change in terms of what could be delivered by the ambulance service. Yet there was still the role for the volunteers. Not only because they could never have an ambulance on every corner of every street, so those Volunteers who were there for lives within their own community were very often first on scene and able to deliver the initial life-saving interventions, as well as being able to take some enhanced skills to support the newly developing paramedic role. So at this time, I was somewhere else. I grew up in Lincolnshire, but at the age of 18 I went to university, studied medicine, in the northeast, and then I uh, did a few jobs in Gateshead, and then I went to this place. Any ideas where that is? Who recognises it? <laughs> Whitby. Yes, <laughs> I had the pleasure of three years on a GP training scheme in Whitby and Scarborough, and it was during that time that I became introduced to the world of pre-hospital emergency medicine. But it wasn't known as FEM then as it is now. It was basics doctors. And my trainer in general practice was a guy called Derek Luxton, who was one of these real died in the wool, keen, out every hour of the night doctors supporting his local ambulance service on the moors of Whitby. And I started going out with him, and I've never stopped since. So Derek had lots of. Um, interesting characteristics. One was that he was notoriously behind in surgery and that's when he even hadn't been out to an accident. And patients would ring up and say, how far behind is Lockie? And say, oh it's three hours. What time's your appointment? Five o'clock. Oh come at eight then. And he was notoriously behind but he gave the patients all the time they needed. But sometimes he was also out at the moor or somebody crushed by a cow or somebody who'd fallen off the cliff and I was often there with him and got that bug of making that immediate care and immediate, immediate difference. So I finished there, 83, 93, and I came to Lovely Laworth and uh, Hubbard Sills and started in general practice there and it was then that I actually looked out for my local basic scheme and found lives and joined lives in 1993 and as the rest of this say it's history. So what was it that um, was happening at that time? Well it, it was a doctor only organisation at that time. The only people within lives were doctors primarily GPs, but some of the um, specialties, specialists from the hospitals were also part of lives. But there was also the hospital flying squad at that time as well, providing similar sorts of stuff. So I joined, and this is what represents 93 for me, a Volvo 340. That was the car that I had at that time. And I had a little green light that I stuck out the window and stuck on top because doctors had a green light at that time. Not um, that you've got your lap belt on your digger, <laughs> as, as the green light appears to be used nowadays. Um, I had the practice's first mobile phone. I bought this mobile phone and it absolutely revolutionized the life for everybody in the practice because I, up to that point, the, in, it, it's not 
meant to be sexist in any way, but all the partners were men and their wives stayed at home to answer the phone when you were on call. So you'd go and do your call, you'd go home, you'd get the next call from your wife and then up you'd go. I bought this mobile phone at great expense and was able to divert my home phone to it so that my wife and our two children could do normal stuff. Very quickly the partners got whiff of this and said, that newfangled mobile phone thingy, can I borrow it? And it got passed around, the mobile phone got passed around between everybody. But I also had a Motorola pager through which I got my, um, my messages from ambulance control that I was needed. And then I'd ring up on my Nokia mobile phone and off I'd go in my Volvo 340 with my little green light on top. And that was what it was like at that time. <laughs> Uh, a little bit long, 1990, almost year 2000 when we thought the whole world was going to fall over because of this millennium bug. Of course it didn't. Little did they know about coronavirus though, and how that would make it fall over. But in 1999, lives diversified. And actually in response to a request from the Chief Executive of the Ambulance Service, started Community First Responding. CFR, and alongside that, fire co-responding. And this was taking people who are not medically trained and training them initially in basic life support and the use of an AED, a defibrillator, to be around in their community, responding to their community. And this was one of the first places in the whole UK where it was done. And certainly for the fire service, where retained firefighters were also on call for, for lives. It was definitely one of the first places. And in fact, in, in, there are some, ambulance, uh, some fire services that are only just now, uh, 20 years later, achieving what was done by lives in 1999. Quite amazing. And to look at this, the SHAR, which was the School of Health and, Relate, uh, Health and Related Research at the Sheffield University, looked at the outcomes over four years and they found that the impact on the arrival of ambulance time, the impact on survival from cardiac arrest, were really significant from community first responders. And it's one of the key pieces of evidence that has supported the development of first responding throughout the UK from here in Lincolnshire, and something I think we should be justifiably proud, but something which really fits our rural um, county, the fact that you cannot have an ambulance on every corner, but someone who is there early to recognise and do the basics well is what really saves lives. <clears throat> this is an article that I've had bookmarked on my iPad for years. It's now archived and it doesn't work anymore, which is really sad, because it's, it's uh, published December 2011, and it showed every road accident that happened from year 2000 to 2010. Because at that time, Lincolnshire was regularly having triple figure fatalities on our roads from every year. So when we see those boards which say 24 this year, 25 last year, it was regularly over 100 deaths every year. And I got to the point where I was actually getting quite haunted driving round from the fatalities that I'd been to. And I would get back the, the smells and the sounds. And I very nearly stopped doing this because of the way that that was haunting. But actually, I recognised that for every one of those that was haunting me, there were several more that were actually incredibly rewarding, knowing that I'd made the difference, sometimes between somebody living and dying. So something had to be done about this massive death rate. As you can see, 1941 was the highest death rate on the British roads. 1966, 67, when I showed the um, 
the traveller, or his traveller, almost as high, and it was the highest peacetime death rate on our roads. And then we got to 2000, and we hit this plateau, and things stopped moving. And that was the real time of concern as to, okay, so what is it that we need to do to get that trend going downwards again? And it has gone downwards, and it's hit a plateau again. So what do you think made the big difference between there and there? Seatbelts. Seatbelts. Ah. Seatbelts was a big one. Drink driving, perhaps, but maybe not as big as the seatbelts. What else? Speed limits. Speed limits. Probably even more so than that. Vehicle technology. Airbags. Airbags. Crumple zones. The sort of things that now I will go to a vehicle at huge, huge speed, closing speeds, and someone's got out because the compartment in which they have been is intact. Did anyone see the incident between Lewis Hamilton and Max Verstappen on Sunday? And the difference that the halo system made for that, because it created a safe space. Fine, he still got hit on his helmet, but it was a safe space. And that's really one of the biggest differences for us, is that creation of crumple zones, airbags, safe spaces. Because before airbags, before using seat belts, before crumple zones, it wasn't just the single initial impact that was causing the problem. There's the impact, the body would continue and then hit a secondary structure and a second impact, and then the internal organs would continue and there would be a third impact. And a lot of that has been mitigated by pre-tensioning systems. And I know in my Volvo, if I go over a bump a bit too fast, it pins me back into the seat. In fact, I went over two on a, on a blue light run the other day and it pinned me in once and then before I could release it, I went over another and it pinned me in a second time and I was like, I can't breathe. <laughs> but that's the sort of thing that would have stopped me being ejected through my windscreen in, in the past had I hit something and gone from 60 to zero. So that's the biggest thing is this vehicle technology, but also road technology and design, the fact that we have learned on the whole Having said that, there is one certain junction that I went to um, 11 RTCs in 14 days, two years ago. And I actually, sorry council, I did ring up and say the white lines have gone on this junction. People are going across it because they don't realise. So road technology has improved, so long as we keep that progress maintained. Things like, for example, cutting the vergers on the corners. And again, you know, I appreciate money has to be saved somewhere, but the cutting of the vergers now sometimes creates some difficulty in terms of visibility at these junctions. So, yes, road technology and design has improved significantly, but I still think there is so much more we could do. And the third thing is the changes in the medical care. And if we go back to this, this bit, <laughs> reflects, in my opinion, the lessons that we learned from Iraq and Afghanistan. The medical advances that we have which have come out of war. The technologies that we are using and that I'll talk to you about that have come from the squaddies who've stood on IEDs. It's, it's sad that we learn these things from war. It would be wrong not to use that technology. The war has happened, whether we like it or not. The technology, we should absolutely take those, those learnings and put them into our civilian life so that the young lad who has died hasn't died in vain. The, the knowledge that we have from that makes a difference on our roads. And that's what reflects a lot of that there but we're still left with this plateau again so go back to this 
This is something that hasn't changed. Human factors. What do I mean by human factors? You mentioned, think it was yourself, drink driving. What other human factors? Drugs, Drugs. Drugs. speed, tiredness. tiredness. We can put it into the, the fatal four. This, these are all human factors and they have not changed over the years. And perhaps the plateau that we've got now is a reflection of those human factors. And I think, you know, we can see from the amount of attention that's paid to the human factors, to the fatal four, why they are so important. Because we're not going to get that plateau any lower until we do address these. So, you, you know them. Inappropriate speed, driver distractions, particularly the mobile phone, lack of seatbelt, alcohol or drug impairment. <clears throat> So let's just talk a little bit about the medical advances, because obviously that, that's what I do. And I think we can probably divide this into, into three broad areas. The first is evidence-based medicine, second, wider system development, and the third is local system developments. <clears throat> so, evidence-based medicine. When I first was a life doctor, one of the things that we often did to people who'd sustained trauma was cannulate them and put in two litres of salty water because we thought it was a good idea, plus uh, saline. Because that, that was, yeah, that, that's good, yeah, right, I got a big cannula in, I got two litres in. Okay, but where was the evidence for that? Well, actually, there wasn't any evidence. We thought it was a good idea. But there's always been a paucity of research done in the pre-hospital environment, but increasingly there is, led by organisations like the Faculty of Pre-Hospital Care, which is here at the Royal Surgeons, at Royal College of Surgeons in Edinburgh. So I, I studied there, did my um, Diploma of Immediate Medical Care, and took my exam there, and I have the dubious pleasure of being knocked down just outside the Royal College of Surgeons in Edinburgh. <clears throat> I'd been for, actually for the presentation um, of the certificate and everything, I had my fancy gown on, I'd given that back, and we were rushing to get back and went across a uh, pedestrian crossing, little green man, and somebody went through on red and hit me. And I, and, well, you know what happens. And the chap came, jumped out and he ran up to me and he said, I'm a doctor, I'm a doctor. Oh and, oh, I don't know if I can say this. And I said, yeah, so am I, just off. <laughs> anyway, there's a couple of police there. They'd seen, they called an ambulance, the whole caboodle. At least I was well enough to say that. It transpired. I said, so, calm down. What kind of doctor are you? Oh, uh, I've got a PhD in biochemistry. Mm. So, so you couldn't even mend me if I was broken then. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, so yes, got knocked down outside there. But also the <coughs> National Institute of uh, Clinical Excellence, Health and Care Excellence, um, which produced guidelines, um, a very sad NG37, for example, on the management of trauma based on evidence. <laughs> but also, the beginning of the intercollegiate board for the training in pre-hospital emergency medicine. So FEM was born and this new subspecialty of medicine became um, evolved under mainly the leadership of a chap called Rod McKenzie who's one of the consultants at Addenbrooke's and one of the, the main um, <coughs> drivers between MAGPAS, the Air Ambulance and Basics Charity in Norfolk area. But IBT FEM has really moved things on and there is now a real tight evidence-based set of competencies that you need to have to be able to practice at this. 
But then there's also the wider system developments. And again, this ties in with this recognition that we can't just do things because we've licked a finger, stuck it in the air, and it seems a good idea. And it started with the Trauma Audit and Research Network, TARN, and the development of major trauma centres. So again, this is only, um, just trying to find exactly when the first one was, uh, about around 2000, no, 1988, uh, 1988 was the wor working party, no, uh, 2000 was the second, was the, was the first major trauma centre. And these are hospitals which have every specialty that you need if you've sustained polytrauma, multiple trauma. So they have neurosurgery, they have cardiothoracic surgery, they have abdominal surgery, they have every specialty you can imagine. Because the evidence is, if you've sustained major trauma and you go to a major trauma centre, let's, let's set aside if you survive, there is a 20% higher chance of surviving your major trauma if you go to a major trauma centre as opposed to a trauma union. That's the figures, which is startling, and I'll take that. It's a bigger chance than me getting the lottery with my ticket that I buy. 20% greater chance of being alive after your major trauma because you go to that hospital. But if we then look at those who have morbidity, in other words, don't die, but actually have complications of their major trauma, the numbers are really significant that by going to a major trauma centre as opposed to a trauma unit, you do really well. Now, the big disadvantage for us is this big blank hole. Because Lincolnshire doesn't have a major trauma centre. So our nearest is Queen's Medical Centre, Nottingham, Hull Royal Infirmary, Adam Brooks, or Northern General Hospital in Sheffield. So, QMC, Hull. And if I get knocked down with polytrauma outside the front doors of Lincoln County. Please take me to there if I can get there alive because of that advantage. Now that's not casting any aspersions on Lincoln County Hospital, but I just know what the figures are of how much greater my outcome will be by going to a major trauma centre. But if you're in Skegness in the middle of the night, it's a real challenge to get to a major trauma centre. Now we work alongside uh, Lynx Knots Air Ambulance, the air ambulance service from um, uh, East Midlands Airport, Mag Pass down at Witten, and Yorkshire up in um, Weatherby. But they can't be there for every accident, every time. So we've got to ensure that we can fill those gaps. And that's one of the biggest roles that LIVES does. So that when it is the middle of the night and it's raining or it's foggy or the temperature's not right and we can't fly, and I've, until January I've just flown the last eight years on Lynx Not Air Ambulance, so I'm, I'm part of that, have been part of it, so I'm not dissing it. But it can't be there every minute of the day for every patient and every instant. Or if there are two people in a car, it can only take one. And that's why one of the big things that we talk about is it takes a team to save a life. One organisation can't possibly cover off every base. And we can't do that. The air ambulances can't. The ambulance service itself can't. So we have to work together collaboratively to ensure that we can get people to these major trauma centres alive. There are trauma units. The Lincoln uh, ULH2, uh, Deepal, and Scunny, and Peterborough. And we, um, the, the importance of the trauma units is that if you are too unwell to survive to a major trauma centre, their role is to stabilise you so you then can have a secondary transfer to a major trauma centre. And it's something that we, we have to work 
with to ensure that as a system it works together. But the difficulty is, um, what if you're a child? Because the problem is, Paul is an adult major trauma centre, but not a paediatric. No. Queen's is, but if you're in Grimsby, do you really want to go all the way to Queen's in Nottingham? So we have to then use paediatric major trauma centres, which is Sheffield or Queen's Medical Centre. So when you're on scene with an incident, all of this is going through your mind as to, okay, what's the best way to get this patient to the right place? Because pre-alerting to the right hospital first time is going to contribute towards that survival of those people and help us maintain that big downward step on the curve. We use this, which is the East Midlands Major Trauma Triage Tool. Step one, two, three, four. At step one, step two, you definitely go to Major Trauma Centre so long as you can get there alive. So if you've got a compromised airway, and are never going to get to the MTC alive. You need to go to a trauma unit to have your airway managed and then on to the major trauma centre. Step three is where we start considering some of the softer indications, step four. But there is a tool that's used across the area to try and ensure that everybody gets to the right hospital. And the same, using helicopters where possible. And I, at night I use the um, search and rescue helicopter from um, Humberside Airport and I've taken three patients at a time because you can have a party in there it's so flipping big um, I've taken three patients at one time to hull in that because they can fly when the mist is on the ground and stuff like that because they've got all the search technology the instrument stuff but for the majority of the time there may not be any advantage in flying by the time you've loaded, transferred, offloaded, transferred to the hospital. And sometimes we have to make these careful decisions. Okay, so it's going to be five minutes, 10, 50, uh, yeah, yeah, okay, right, uh, yeah, that's the right way, or no, that's the right way, helicopter or, or land. Um, because sometimes it's a lot closer than you imagine. So what have we done in lives to try and improve? local systems. So I took on this role for, for, uh, six years ago and I've worked really hard to bring in as much of that evidence-based practice into what we do, whether that be at a level one community first responder or a level eight critical care doctor. It doesn't matter. Within your level there is a scope of practice as to what you are trained and competent in doing and actually what's probably most important is that you're current in doing it so I might have learned to change a widget once in 1970 does it mean I'm still able to change that widget now not necessarily so what do I do well I I either do it when it's necessary on real patients or I simulate it and train it and now that can be quite difficult for some of the surgical interventions we do. And one of the things that we put our critical care doctors, paramedics, nurses through is they go to do a cadaveric course. So they go to um, Coventry where they fly in people from America who have given their bodies for medical research. And we do the surgical interventions on those people who have died because you you cannot practice some of these skills without knowing what it really feels like and i think it's incredibly generous of those people to do that so that we can get it right so that we can be current when we deliver it next time out for real But we also have worked on progression of development. So we've set really clear, okay, this is the training that you need to get to the next step and to the next step and to the next step, if you want to. Because we accept that somebody who wants to volunteer as a community first responder 
maybe want to just do what they do and not go any further and that's absolutely fine because it's the basics that saves lives doing those well <clears throat> so where are we after our 51 years are we now deliver frec three and four first response emergency care level three and four we now have a community emergency medicine service which is actually commissioned by the ccg um, so that's doctors and uh, paramedics who go to patients who've accessed the health service where we can take some of the emergency department things to them and treat them there and then in their own home rather than going to hospital to try and keep people away from hospital that don't actually have to be there if we have the right treatment for them. We've also developed a full service in conjunction with the county council and the, uh, and the health board and that's some of our um, trained first responders who now go and pick people up who've had uh, falls because they can get there often within half an hour whereas because of the pressure on the ambulance service it might be eight hours till somebody gets picked up otherwise and that in itself produces problems in terms of muscle damage and as a result of that muscle damage which then damages the kidneys and so a system which is really simple and have the foresight particularly of the county council to commission us to do that is really incredible but then we've also now got our critical care clinicians and medic 50. medic 50 is our new platform which we're about to deliver which is an east coast um, critical care car so i say east coast it's it, it's based the, the eastern half of Lincolnshire, particularly at night when the air ambulance based at Waddington has, um, has got their car on, They're, they can't get to Skegness quickly, so we mesh and try to deconflict and support the whole area, the whole system. We've worked hard on keeping people safe and we've just gone through a whole procurement in, in terms of the personal protective equipment, not just the COVID stuff, but the stuff to enable people to be at road accidents safe. But keeping people safe in terms of driver training, in that our doctors, paramedics, nurses are trained in blue light driving. But of course, there is an update, I'm sure you're probably aware of the um, latest um, development in terms of register for blue light drivers. Um, so all of our clinicians who are currently blue light drivers, who've done the Institute of Healthcare Development, the IHCD D2 license, which I did back in 95 or, yeah, 95, are now having to do another set of training. Interestingly, one of the things that can be counted as points towards that is the IAM Gold Award. I understand. So maybe an opening there for you. Um, so keeping people safe. And we've also started joining up with what's called the attack faculty, which is the anaesthesia, trauma and critical care faculty. Um, in terms of the way that we treat, uh, teach and develop trauma management. So we use that March algorithm. M start, starts from massive hemorrhage where you, if you've got someone who's bleeding, put the plug in, because every red cell counts. Whether it's putting the plug in, or putting a tourniquet on, or a bandage which actually clots in the hole to stop the bleeding. Because this, this is a picture of a pelvis, so a couple of hips there, that bit shouldn't be open. This is what's referred to as an open book pelvis. This is a classic injury that motorcyclists get who T-bone cars, they T-bone, they go forward, they smash their pelvis off the tank and dim the tank, and then they go upwards and over the car, and as they go up, they tend to break the femurs. But this, the pelvis is absolutely full of blood vessels, and it's catastrophic hemorrhage, but we just can't see it. And actually, closing that, to stop that space, is as life-saving as putting a tourniquet on. 
So if I see get there first to somebody like this, the first thing I'll often do is I will manually just get hold of the pelvis and hold it like that until we can put a pelvic binder on. And that can stop massive hemorrhage. Because massive hemorrhage now comes before airway. So if you bled out, it doesn't really matter if you've got an airway. And airway in the march, in a structured way. And fine, this is the classic breathing tube that you might see on Orby City. But people don't die because they haven't got a breathing tube. They die because they haven't got an airway. And something as simple as tilting the head is far more effective than a fancy bit of kit like that. So it's a structured approach. Making people breathe properly. And one of the things that we're really becoming aware of is what's referred to, um, it's, it's known throughout the um, the country as silver trauma, which isn't in any way meant to be disrespectful, but it's a description of the difference that people who are older, hence the silver analogy, um, they can sustain major trauma from standing. And I saw somebody last year who'd fallen off the first step of a step ladder, cleaning the windows, sustained a chest injury which ended up, simple fall from height, 21 days in intensive care, simply from standing. And that wouldn't have happened if they were 20, but because they were 74, it led to 21 days in ITU. So we've got to be really aware that chest trauma, particularly in that older group, is really, really important. And early pain control allows people to breathe properly. And if we don't do that, then we've already started to play catch up. Can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. you, you could find mm. this um, the broken pelvis. Yeah. How do you know there's a broken pelvis? If you can imagine that the, the pelvis is opened like that, yeah. as you walk to somebody, their feet, normally your feet wouldn't point outwards. Yeah. So if you imagine it's open, so you've gone like you can tell when they're lying there. You, you lying. look and the feet are out like that. So if you actually want to take the tights off, and you wrap that around them and pull it together, would that be a life saving? It would. Yes. Yeah. 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 Any excuse to get a tie? <laughs> <laughs> Do you know, it used to be fan belt, didn't it? Yeah. <laughs> well, if you have yeah. to do that as well. Yes. On a honeymoon. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, circulation. Um, but it's actually, you know, I said about the filling up with, with two litres of salty water. What we know now is if you pour in two litres of salty water into somebody's circulation, one, you make them cold, two, you dilute all the clotting factors, the things that stop them clotting, and what we, we now call the, the, the triad of, of death in trauma is getting cold, is having a problem with your clotting, and having a low blood, blood volume. So it's about putting in the right fluid, which ideally is blood, because that's what you've lost. <coughs> And then H in March is the head and everything else. And I, it's, <laughs> head injuries is something I'm really, really passionate about. The reason being is that if someone has a head injury, we can't do anything about what's happened. It's happened. But what happens then is that the area around the bit that's damaged starts to swell. And that causes secondary damage, which develops over hours. And we can absolutely prevent that secondary head injury happening by doing the right things. And that's why I'm so passionate that we use the evidence to do the interventions which stop that ongoing trauma. Because as we said, it's not so much about if you die, but actually the morbidity. What happens to you if you don't die in terms of your quality of life? Or it could be quite callous and say, in terms of what it costs society but actually i care about people more than society so it's what happens to you that matters to me so we're nearly there at the end and i thought what i would do is quickly go through 10 things that i think we can now do 
that make the difference in terms of that big step down on the curve. Number one, the roller coaster. I call it the oxyhema roller coaster, which is that people compensate, particularly children when they're injured. And they compensate until they get to the top of the roller coaster, then off they go down. By the time you're hurtling down the roller coaster, it's often too late. So it's recognising those people that are really sick before they get to the top of the roller coaster. And in particular, I've started using a thing called shock index, which the major trauma centre at Nottingham, if I ring and say, I've got somebody with a shock index of 0.9, they will run through blood, through the warmer, through the pressure machine, what's called a Belmont, and have it ready. So when that patient gets there, they're plugged in. The shock index is your blood pressure divided by your heart rate. Heart rate. I'm um, sorry, heart, heart rate divided by blood pressure. Um, I do it automatically. So obviously if you're, if you're bleeding, your blood pressure goes down and your heart rate goes up as you compensate. So the bigger the number you get, in other words, the shock index, the more likely you are bleeding. And anyone who's got a shock index about above 0.7 has got a 35% chance of having a blunt, non-compressible bleed inside. So it's a really bit useful bit of information to recognise before they head down that roller coaster. This is actually one of my favourite drugs, a big syringe full of momentum. Because actually, that's far more important than half of the drugs that I carry. Getting a move on, getting a wriggle on. Don't, don't be on, on scene for hours and end. The target is to get somebody to a major trauma centre within 60 minutes of their injury. It's never going to happen at Skeggy in the middle of the night, but we can try. Particularly if we have a large syringe full of momentum. Other people like diesel as their favourite drug, because it gets you there. The second thing is using a tool that's called Samurai Laser from, um, from Attack. And it talks about the mode, speed and route of extrication. So you have somebody trapped within a car. So, the mode, is it self, is it assisted, is it manual, do you have to get them out? Speed, do we need to be urgent, rapid, or immediate, do we need them out now? And that's really useful when you're telling, uh, telling firefighters how long you want somebody out. We'll say, how long do you want? And I always, like, if I think it's 10 minutes, I'll tell them five, because I'll always take 10. And then the route. Is it linear? Do we get somebody out in line nice and controlled? Do we angle them? Do we come out sideways? Or do we have to just emergency? This patient's not joint breathing, so we just grab and accept collateral damage. Or do we actually have to relocate? Which might mean actually getting somebody to move a vehicle away. Which is quite scary. And you've got to be careful with that because somebody might have just had an accident and be full of adrenaline. Are they the best person to move their vehicle? Possibly not. But they know their vehicle. So that's my number two is using the samurai laser so that we get that movement with people. Number three. This is an interesting one. Treat brain impact apnea. And this is something that you can all do. This is a phenomenon which has only been recognised in the last few years. And is when some people have had a head injury. The head injury stops them breathing instantly. Apnea means no, not breathing. So it's sometimes called impact brain apnea or brain impact apnea. And all it needs is some stimulation for that patient because they haven't actually got an injury to their brain and, and that's going to cause disability, but they've had an injury which has stopped them breathing. I went to a, an accident not far from my home about four years ago, and it was so close to my home, I was first on the scene. A car that had hit a tractor in the dark, leapt a fence, a uh, hedge, and was in a muddy field. And there's a young woman in the back, and I got there, first there, and she's not breathing. 
So this was about probably four or five minutes after the incident. And I just grabbed her, went to drag her out, at which point she went, <gasps> and actually survived neurologically intact, but would have died otherwise. And that's impact brain apnea. And it's one of those things that simply just holding the head, stimulating, are you all right? Maybe all that's necessary to make these people breathe again. So simple and it's worth knowing about. So that's one that I'm passionate about. Number four, structured airway management. Don't go to gold standard. If actually this one is right and quick and good, do it in a structured way. <clears throat> Another one, which is treating traumatic cardiac arrest as a different illness. So, Traumatic cardiac arrest is where you have a cardiac arrest secondary to trauma. It's simple, but it's entirely different from medical cardiac arrest where you've had a, something that stopped your heart. TCA, traumatic cardiac arrest, is usually because you've got an obstructed airway, you've got a pressure within your lung called a, a tension due to thorax, um, or, um, your, or a low blood volume. And by, if you address those three things completely separately, there is as good um, an outcome from that as there is for medical cardiac arrest. If you treat it as a medical cardiac arrest, in other words, trying to just simply rely on a, a defibrillator and, and chest compressions, the survival rate is virtually nil. If you treat it with a hot approach, as it's referred, high, uh, hypovolemia, oxygenation, tension, pneumothorax, it's as good a survival as other cardiac arrests. So that, that's another, another big one for me. Optimise the damaged chest, I've already talked about it. If people have pain around their chest, they don't breathe properly. So you might only have got one broken rib, but treat it properly and the outcome will be far better. And we, might, we now use things like this to support that. This little machine, believe it or not, allows us to measure blood tests at the roadside within 90 seconds. So I now will do a blood gas on somebody. So I'll take an arterial sample, put it into my little machine, and it will tell me how well they are breathing. Will tell me their oxygen level in the blood, carbon dioxide level, whether there's acid building up in the blood. It will tell me a lactate, which is an indication of whether they're bleeding, all from that little roadside test. And similarly, we use this. This is an iPhone. This thing is a butterfly. This is an ultrasound machine that I have in my car out there. And I can tell whether someone's got a collapsed lung. I can tell whether somebody's bleeding from their liver or their spleen, or in their pelvis, using my ultrasound machine. I can even use it to find a blood vessel when the blood volume is so low that everything's collapsed. These are the things that allow us to target what we're doing. Number seven, damage control resuscitation. This is the big one from Iraq and Afghanistan. This is all about resuscitating people with the right fluid, preferably blood, but not simply just replacing everything they lost, because if you push a load of blood into somebody, push their blood pressure up, all those points that have now started to clot, like in the pelvis or wherever, just blow the clots off and they bleed again. So we accept a lower level. And this is what actually allowed people to survive horrendous injuries in Gulf War in Afghanistan, and we now use it. But alongside that is a project that we're just doing, which is Code Crimson, where LIVES is working with the blood transfusion service, so that if we have a patient who we believe to be bleeding, and have evidence that we believe, we can ring them, this number, we can then send the police who will go and fetch the blood for us, bring it to scene, and that blood is the difference between us having to go to a trauma unit or making it to a major trauma centre. 
and we're hoping that within three months this is going to be running. Neuroprotection, my number eight, which is actually that whole thing about we can't stop that primary brain injury, but we can sure as hell stop the rest of it. And the way I generally do that is I give people pre-hospital emergency anaesthetics. So this is part of our critical care cadre. So we put people into the induced coma at the roadside, and as a result of that, we can then change how we breathe for them so that the oxygen level and the carbon dioxide level are right and stop that brain swelling. <coughs> and we can use that little machine to test what the levels are, and then we can change our ventilator. The sort of stuff that happens in an intensive care unit at the roadside here in Lincolnshire. And number nine is in terms of what we have achieved, where we are, pre-hospital surgical intervention. I've given a picture of a heart. I'm going to be a little bit vague. I um, stapled a stab wound in somebody's heart within the last six months in their front room, having opened them. And that only comes because of the training that we can have from those people who give their bodies. The sort of thing that would only normally happen in a major trauma centre unless you have those skills. And then my number 10 is absolutely work as a wider team. I've told you about what we do as lives, but we can't do that without the air ambulance, without the ambulance service, without the fire service, without the police service, without search and rescue, without Coast Guard, without Joe Public who perhaps opens that airway, who recognises that somebody is hosing out from a cut artery and takes off their belt and makes a makeshift tourniquet. These are the sort of things that mean that we can make these difference, that we can keep that plateau where it is and hope that others can achieve the human factors bit to take it down further. This was an incident down on the A17, just a little example of one of the teams on scene. It takes a team, not down to one organisation or one person. <coughs> so what's our future? My dream is that we attract people to Lincolnshire who are qualified, high quality healthcare professionals, that we can keep them here because they recognise it's a good place to work. And if we can be a part of that, then I really hope that we can. We're just about, um, we've made a bid for the land, we can't, they can't tell you where it is, but if I say central Lincolnshire, to build um, a £6 million education centre, which we believe will be the first in UK, possibly in Europe, um, specifically designed to train for pre-hospital emergency medicine and try and attract people here. It's a great place to live. It will have within it a modular house where you can learn to train how to get somebody down a staircase. You'll be able to take in a whole caravan or a tractor and it will have sky walls that come down. We also, within it, have a thing called the dirty room, which is a space which is modular high tech, 360 high definition projection where it will rain and it will go cold and it will go misty, it will go dark and it will come light again. Because if you train hard, you play easy. It's a lot of money. We've made lots of applications for government funding to support it because this is all about building skills and the future of skills in Lincolnshire and we really believe that as part of an organisation we can be there as part of it. Alongside that we're working with the University of Lincoln, we've already started taking some of their medical students, paramedicine students, nursing students out with us on our vehicles and we've just um, hopefully, well we are starting next year developing a postgraduate um, 
award in critical care at the University of Lincoln. So first outside of many of the big centres. And finally, research. We're gathering lots and lots of data as to what makes a difference. Because we can't be complacent, we need to keep on pushing the boundaries and make Lincolnshire the safest place to have a pre-hospital emergency. Investing in equipment, that won't stop working. Equipment. And finally, it does take a team to save a life. So, thank you ever so much for bearing with me. It's been quite a long time, I believe. Um, but I hope that that's given you a bit of an interesting insight into what happens.